Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the European Marine Board's third Thursday Science Webinar Series. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, happy to welcome you all here. Um, my name is Sheila Heymans. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Board. And um, today we will be speaking on some of the science that's behind our documents. Uh, quick housekeeping rules. Uh, please make sure that your name is entered so that when you ask a question, we know who you are. Please use the Q&A, which should be at the bottom of your screen, to ask your questions. And if you can, please also put where you're from, which country, which organization. Um, once uh, the speaker is finished, I will go through the questions and read them out to him. Um, <clears throat> if you have any technical issues, please use, use the chat function. Uh, and be aware that the webinar is being recorded and it is available on YouTube. I think there's probably people watching there that are, are right now and it will be made available <clears throat> on our website afterwards. Um, so today we are um, talking about the science that's behind our one of our newest documents, Building Coastal Resilience in Europe. Um, and we have uh, a talk on specifically building coastal and marine resilience in Ireland uh, from a community perspective. Um, so the speaker today is Uri Eugene Farrell. He is a lecturer and a researcher in geography at the University of Galway. And he was one of the authors of the position paper um, and a co-lead of the chapter on tools, barriers and enablers. And he uh, wrote the case study on Marish, Maharish Peninsula. <clears throat> so without further ado, I think um, Eugene, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing your screen um, and take it away. Okay, we see your screen, but it's not in full screen mode. And we see your background as well, Eugene. Ah, perfect. Okay, thanks, Sheila. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present today to the European Marine Board. Uh, and absolutely honored uh, to be part of the, the Coastal Resilience position paper. So today I'm gonna to be talking about coastal resilience and I'm gonna be leaning heavily on two reports, one which was the EMB report, but also earlier this year, some work I did that was funded in Ireland, uh, looked at coastal resilience and marine resilience in Ireland. Uh, and I'm gonna look at some of the outcomes of that and some of the, and specifically uh, look at a coastal community that I examined during that research. First off, I think it's important to recognize the the European Marine Board position, uh, coastal resilience uh, position paper. Uh, it was a very interesting experience, very rewarding, and I'd like to recognize uh, all my colleagues. And there's 13 authors in in total from 11 countries, and especially uh, I'd like to thank the two uh, editors uh, on uh, on the paper. So some of this couple of slides uh, are. I've extracted some key figures from the position paper, and uh, just to set, just to set sort of a background. I mean, anyone who's working in coastal marine science would be very familiar with these concepts. Uh, I think what it, what's important here, uh, especially for places like Ireland and the, the Northeast Atlantic, is the drivers and pressures that you see here. Many of these are locked in for Ireland. Uh, a good example is sea level is locked in. In, for the short and medium term future. Uh, there's no doubt we'll have probably a one meter rise by 2050. That's on, based on the medium uh, emissions scenario. And so these pressures and drivers are obviously going to be impacting ecosystems. And I'm very interested in myself in the, the coastal social ecological systems. And that's what we focus on in the position paper. Uh, now linked to this, is coastal resilience and understanding what coastal resilience is and how does it actually uh, moderate or reduce or remove the, the impacts from these pressures on uh, system states. Uh, specifically in the position paper, we looked at two things which are very much coupled and uh, I do the same in this, in this presentation, which is looking at the ecological functions and looking at the socioeconomic functions of uh, any sort of community. 
Uh, overall, what I'm very interested in in my research is what happens in this box of coastal resilience. What is it? Who's doing it? Uh, what are they doing? Where are they doing it? And why are they doing it? And uh, these are all very vague terms, but you'll see a really good example here with the coastal community I'm presenting on. And then figure out, okay, is it working? And if not, why not? And is it easy? Is it, it Are we making just transitions uh, to state, uh, to more resilient states? Just to set the tone as well, I think it's important to understand what coastal resilience is. And the definition I use is a nice one that came from Masterlink and Lazarus paper in 2019 <clears throat> and defines coastal resilience as the capacity of coastal, natural and socioeconomic systems to persist, adapt or transform when faced with disturbances. And there's lots of different types of disturbances. Now, resilience can take on many, many forms. And I think this the position paper is a couple of nice case studies. I'm not going to talk about both of these now, but I do want to mention the one on the left here, which is based in uh, the village of Torcross in England. And they looked at uh, the challenge of actually building resilience and what does it actually mean on the ground. And so the policy strategy or the, the, the decision in this area was twofold. First of all, you have a village here uh, located on a, a very dynamic uh, gravel barrier that is susceptible to erosion from storms. And so they made two decisions. One was to hold the line and essentially build socioeconomic resilience by uh, increasing the size of the seawall, uh, just seaward of the, the houses and businesses there. Conversely, there was a decision made that there be the policy was no more active intervention to repair the the, the for, further up the barrier where there's no housing or no uh, no no buildings as such, and so natural processes will be allowed to basically continue unabated, which what actually will mean that 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 barrier will probably end up rolling over and moving inward towards the lagoon there, and so you have this sort of interesting balance between socioeconomic resilience and ecological geomorphological resilience where if you let the nat natural state uh, operate then by definition ultimately the, these states will be more resilient just for context and how i situate my work uh, is i um, i apply this sort of framework which is from the ipcc now the research I did in Ireland was premise, I guess it was, we, we put a context in, in terms of situating the, the objective of the study, which was, let's say we say in 2050 that Ireland and our coastal systems are resilient. Actually, what does that mean? How do we get them to be resilient? What do we do? What were the enablers and barriers that supported us to make steps to build resilience on the ground and within coastal communities? And so, that involves obviously a lot of different part moving parts. And so one way we decided to look at it was to apply the IPCC framework here, which is uh, uh, built on the climate resilient pathways. And I don't want to dwell on this too much, but it's, it does, I would do want to focus on the importance of decision points in the middle here. So we have a, a state here in, in box A, which is our world, and we have a resilience space in green, and that's getting squeezed from biophysical stressors and social stressors, and uh, they could be many depending on the site specifics. Uh, now, as we make decision points going forward, these decision points have the ability uh, on the ground to actually build climate resilience and take you to a higher state of resilience and lower risk, or conversely, we can make decisions on the ground and within policy and within planning, and within management interventions that actually might end up lowering our resilience and in increasing our risk. And so it's really important to actually understand these pathways and actually understanding these over time in terms of what are the legacy decisions that were made? What decisions are we making now? What decisions are we, do we need to make in the future? Because ultimately we need to have a focus on, uh, on building uh, a higher resilience. So the community I'm going to work on, uh, I'm going to focus on, uh, and I've worked on for the last seven years, is based on the west coast of Ireland, uh, on the Dingle Peninsula. It's on the north side here. It's a tombola that sticks out. It's about five kilometers uh, in length. It gets narrow there in, in the middle of it. By, it's about 600 meters wide. And there's a couple of features. First of all, there's lots of sand dunes. And uh, 
the Sandus dominate most of the Tombolo, except for the northern part where you have two vid- small villages, Kilshanig and Fahamor. And then on both sides, you have very um, uh, in- very impressive bays, Brandon Bay and Tralee Bay. Now, the area is steeped in history, but the focus of my talk today will actually be on the Mahri's Conservation uh, uh, Association, which is a, a volunteer group that emerged in 2016 to actually protect and conserve this whole Tombolo. And I recommend you go listen to some of their talks. The leaders have done a fantastic job of actually promoting their message and promoting their problems and solutions. And so they're available online. It also has a rich history. There's a fifth century uh, monastic site here off Ilan Tanig, which is uh, the largest island off the Tombolo. So some background on the Tombolo. It's, I mean, in terms of... Uh, societal scale you long year round you only have uh 300 310 approximately uh residents year round very low lying tombolo so you can imagine it's very susceptible to to storm impacts now it also only has one road in and one road out and obviously the, the, those two villages on the north side depend wholly on that road being accessible and being open now it's an interesting shift here uh in in the community where it was for forever and ever a, largely a farming and fishing community but uh, more recently the last three decades may, mainly two last two to three decades it's really done on a, a significant transition from land to sea which is what i called it which is uh they've now switched over where the main industries seem to be focused on recreation and tourism and so in the summer months there's a huge influx of visitors visitors to this area and obviously that brings with it its own problems. In terms of the nature and the natural, it's besides being a, a very beautiful area, it is also designated multiple uh, environmental uh, protection statuses, which is the special areas of conservation, special protection areas. These are EU driven, the Ramsar site nearby. And so even in Ireland, it actually has the highest number of protected habitats. Uh, What's interesting, I guess, just to set the tone as well, which is uh, this is actually Ireland wide. Uh, it has a total of seven dune habitats within the Tombolo, a huge percentage, and over three quarters of the area is fixed dunes. And they're, according to the our reports, the EU on the status, our conservation assessment results, the status of our habitats, they're unfavorably bad. So you can imagine seventy five percent of the dunes in the in the area are in a very poor shape. The dune slacks as well, which you'll see later, are very important habitat for the things like the natter jack toad, which is one of our few amphibians in Ireland, is actually deteriorating. And so Ireland-wide, we've had a real problem responding to these scorecards. And we're on the third iteration now. And um, hopefully some, uh, some big structural changes in the National Parks and Wildlife Service will actually uh, mitigate some of these ongoing problems. So what are the problems? On, and these are, I'm going to run through some of the pressures on the, the coastal, social, ecological systems in Maharees. And so I'm going to start off with one which, was, which is prevalent in a lot of Northwest Europe, which is too little sand. And you get uh, widespread, widespread and chronic sand erosion and dune retreat. In this case, uh, the dunes have gone back over 70 metres over approximately in recorded time but more specifically we've got more accurate data it's, uh, it's 65 centimeters a year in the last 45 years increasing actually in the last couple of years and one of the problems you have in the Maharese is any high spring tide runs right up to the the toe of the dunes and can scarp them causing mass slumping and so you get this chronic sand uh, chronic dune erosion pushing the whole system backwards there's actually some really good visual evidence of this in 1979, they built, uh, this is a drain pipe here that actually, when it was built, it connected to the road. And so that the road was flooding. And so they had a drain pipe in. And you can see that, that it's nearly 26, 27 meters from the dune today, it's sitting right in the middle of the beach. I guess one of the interesting things that happened to me when I first started working down this area was I met a local resident and he actually gave me letters that they had sent 20 years ago to local government. Ask, actually, first of all, like the, the local residents identified the problems. They knew that people 
uh, accessing the dunes and basically uncontrolled sort of access uh, behavior was impacting the dune health. They realized the road, which is very close to the, the edge of the dune, is very highly, highly vulnerable. And actually, if the road goes, that's a, a threat to the entire uh, that's a threat to the entire peninsula. And so, unfortunately, they got no no basically they got no support. Uh, I think for, there could be multiple reasons for that. I don't quite know, but it was a uh, I think it, the the local pop uh, group tried to mobilize multiple times, but never really got over the line. And so there was little uh, they could do over the, all these years. So too much sand is also a problem because you have systems like this where you have, I guess you call, we call them streamer corridors uh, in, I guess, coastal science where you have a low, you have a low dip in topography in, in, the, in the dune height at the front. And so it steers the wind. And what happens is the wind pushes large volumes of sand over the dune, creating these sand sheets, which then, uh, because the vegetation is buried, the sand that follows it just goes straight to the road. And so, well, yeah, the situation was in 2015, 16, the winter of, in Maharese, this section of the road had to be cleaned out 17 occasions. And so you can imagine how this, th there's, this, there's a huge issue with this because people can't go to work, children can't go to school. Uh, in fact, it just impacts, you can imagine the mental stress of this situation. And they tried to intervene a couple of times, but basically they, they got no luck uh, in terms of uh, finding solutions. Invasive species is a, a really important issue in this area. Uh, this is just a, a drone shot looking right down the, the, uh, the middle of the tambola. You can see the sea buckthorn in the middle of the dark color. Uh, I just recently had a, a master's student, Ms. Helen Helenka Harmon, finish her work, and she just mapped it all and found that in the last 20 years, this buckthorn has increased, expanded in area at 98%. Now, the sea buckthorn originally was put in as a... As a as a management tool back, I guess, when people didn't know any better. And that's that's fair enough. Uh, I think there's lots of legacy decisions that we're managing for now along lots of coastlines in Ireland and elsewhere. So I guess my, the issue here is what's the reaction going to be now that we know that this is an invasive species and it's really having negative effects. I've listed six of them there on the, on the health of these dunes. So you can imagine... The European report that came back saying these dunes are in a, a poor state. They've known this for 20 years, and yet uh, there's been no action done on the buckthorn. Now, because it's spreading over the dunes, the buckthorn is now becoming uh, surrounding these dune stacks. And these dune stacks and maharees are really important for the, the natter jack toll. This is where the natter jacks come and breed between the months of like March, April, May, June. Uh, that's they're the breathing ones for the Natterjack. They come out of the dunes and they go into these dune slacks. Um, so one the what these dune slacks have water which is warm and which is shallow, so it's perfect uh breeding ground for the Natterjacks. But if they do need the surrounding dunes not to be covered in buckthorn, otherwise uh basically they'll be squeezed out of this habitat. Loss of heritage is an important one. I mean, the scent, as I've worked on this location now since 2015, there's real pride, there's real passion, there's real sense of identity of a coastal community. I, I see this all around Ireland. Um, because you had this very significant tr economic transition, really, from uh, the land to the sea, what's actually happened is there's also been place names that have actually changed um, because the new the new community has different names for... Uh, for locations. Dumps and shitties are actual names that the water sport community have uh, associated with certain spots along the Tombolo, much obviously that those names wouldn't resonate well with lots of uh, local residents. And you can see this is an example here. Uh, this picture is taken on the right is taken from the EMB report. And this is the road into, into Maharese. You can see there's a big water sport uh, uh, facilities there in the summer and lots of people and caravan parks are packed to the brim there. Farming is what I always associate Maharese with. I've known Maharese for a long, long time now. And uh, 
it was famous for its carrots, its onions, its parsnips, it's famous for its vegetables for years and years. In fact, when I was growing up, I know the area because my father's from this area. And so they had a co-op there where all the farmers, there's 200 of them all got together, they shared their vegetables and the distribution thereof. And so it was, it was highly, highly impactful and basically economical, viable and profitable vegetable uh, business in Mahri's for a long time. That has actually dis that has gone since, and there's actually very few, very very few farmers left because of the, they can't compete with the external markets. Tourism is an issue. Obviously, you get lots of pressure in the summer. You go to a small area with a population of three hundred and ten year round. Suddenly, uh, orders a magnitude larger than that during the during the during the summer months. Just for perspective. It's 11 kilometers long, and yet there's only eight parking spaces and no toilets. So you can imagine the react. Then what happens is visitors park anywhere, go to the toilet anywhere, and the whole place is unmanaged. That gives you insight into the overall problem here uh, in 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 Maharis in the Tambolo. Other issues are traffic congestion. People seem to behave differently when they go on holidays. They camp and they trespass and leave trash behind. It took 30 people two hours to pick up all this while camping leftovers. They parked on the beach and on the dunes, especially. So the dunes broke down. You can see big blowouts here. And so these are all issues with tourism, which are impacting not just the tourist experience, the visitor experience, but also obviously the local residents. And there, there's potential for a huge impact here. If you have a road that people can't drive up and down and the paramedics need to get down there, then there could be severe consequences. Flooding is another issue. Seasonal flooding, mainly in terms of winter time on the north side of the peninsula in Kilshan. You can see here uh, the water table is very close. Uh, it's very. It's also at sea level. Uh, the water table is also very close to the surface, and so this could be three months of water year round. On the entrance to the Tambolo, you have an area called Trench here, uh, which is. A bridge and so the sluice gates here and you can see this area squeezed between Loch Gill so you can imagine lots of water coming from the the lake down the the, 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 the stream system and then you at the same time you have a lot of sediment being pushed up by storm surge that basically shuts down the sluice gates on the bridge causing uh causing flooding locally here so there's lots of problems as you can see and finally I won't get onto this too much but they even had a fire here in June where three acres burned uh, on the dune, unknown cause. Now, what are the solutions? Well, the solutions started in February 2016, and this is when there was a public meeting in uh, the local village called Castle Gregory, and it was a full house. I was asked to present there because I was doing research the year, I started doing research there the year before, and so I was asked to present the some of the results. I just talked to the community about what I was doing, and at that the end of that meeting, I provided basically what I considered a roadmap of how they can protect themselves because it was it was clearly there was significant concern to, of of the community of how to actually address all these problems. The camel that uh, well not the camel the straw that broke the camel's back was actually uh, the the winter before I uh, right before that pre that public presentation when the road was actually uh, had to be cleaned seventeen times, and so I gave them a bunch of. Uh, recommendations how to build resilience essentially and i think this was when uh when i left the the local residents stayed behind and what emerged was the maharis conservation association what have they done and i'm going to quickly run through these because ultimately i can't cover everything they do i'd highly recommend you go to their facebook page it's open source you can go in and actually look at how active they are but also I want to just present what they did and the challenges of what, of how they actually went about all these actions in and on themselves. So too little sand, there's issues here with actually these blowouts that are being regenerated potentially because if this long, if this high part of the dune goes, it just, the road becomes e extremely vulnerable. And so they filled up these blowouts with both straw bales, uh, with cherry pickers, with Christmas trees, they started controlling access to reduce these blowouts because you can see here the blowouts, they remove cars from them. They remove, they basically control access to people who are having a narrow path with fencing, with signposts. And they have to start the process of actually fundraising because they had no money. It's a nascent community, brand new. 
then they figured out, okay, learning, okay, how do we actually restore the dune as such? And so it became a nature-based solutions became really prominent in their activities and marrow grass planting happened uh, in, multiple, in multiple locations along, along their, uh, the stretch along Brandon Bay. Now, what's important here is not only did they have to do marrow grass planting, but they also had to do fencing to make sure people stayed off because they had to shut down these access routes. People are parking illegally on the dune, coming over the dune onto the beach. Uh, and that's basically a lack of uh, planning in the area. It didn't allow for easy access and parking for people. So people just do what they want when they want. And so the local community decided to ha take full control over this situation. So they had to learn how to do marrow grass planting. They partnered up with a clean coast, which is an NGO here in Ireland who do uh who could who'd show communities how to do activities such as uh just such as marmoglass glass planting has been uh incredibly successful. This is an example here of a bloat in 32 months it's nearly back up it's, it's risen nearly three meters it's nearly fully vegetated it's nearly back up to the the top of the dune again where there was a big hole and that's basically sustained action by the community over a period of uh over nearly three years now. So what's the end result here? The end result is that they've actually completely restored some of these areas. And this is an example of one of the main blowouts from 2016 to 2021. And the areas have become one. But I guess there's a caveat here where it requires a, a lot, a lot of work and maintain and consistent work, sustained work. So there's constantly a need for volunteers to give up their time. I've, I've identified some enables and barriers here, which I got from basically these are came from the communities when you ask them, okay, what worked, what didn't work? And so they identified the neighbors and barriers there, which we can go through afterwards if 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 you want. What I found really interesting was a book came out locally and it had a picture of uh, essentially nature-based solutions going on in 1949 to stop um, dune, uh, sand, windblown sand. And on the very same dune, uh, visitors to this uh, caravan park actually got involved in the same nature-based solution intervention and they were doing marrow grass planting on this high dune because the blowing sand was blowing sand into the campsite too much sand this was a nice interesting project because this is where the local community group really started to make very successful partnerships with key stakeholders such as national parks wildlife service so what happened was in order to get anything done we decided to hold a meeting on the dune with the key stakeholders, such as uh, local Kerry County Council, the National Parks Wildlife Service, the local community and uh, university lecturers. And so we talked about solutions. The community said, came up with a solution for some fencing. And because this is in a special area conservation, the MPWS from years past really did, for some reason, they were stuck on anyone doing anything in SACs. They're, their approach seemed to be more preservation, not conservation, and just they had like a museum approach where they locked off any potential for actions in these areas. But it was it was pointed out to them that health and safety is a risk. If this road is closed and paramedics need to get down, there could be a fatality. And so that really did change the tune where there's there are occasions if human life is at risk, you are allowed to take action. And so they got money from Kerry County Council and... Uh, to do the, the fencing, we wrote a proposal and got it signed off by National Parks Wildlife Service. So three fences were installed. And you can see the meeting on the dunes took place October 16. Implementation of the do of the fences by the community, by the way, no one else. They were they were given the money and they were given the fencing and it was dropped off and they were, it was up to them to install it uh, in April 2017. And the, the, the best message is the road has been cleared since. It has now not been blocked since. So this really gave the local community really um, respect and real kudos in the uh, in the in the local, I guess, in the whole location. People now understood that this group can be impactful. Again, there's lots of enablers and barriers to this too. This work does not happen. They have to get the money themselves. They have to train themselves. They have to figure out where to put the fences. I guess working people like myself can help, and they have to constantly maintain these fences and actually lift them when they the most seaworthy ones get buried. Invasive species, I'd like to point out that the sea buckthorn, nothing's been done about it. It's too much of a problem, I think. It's just too big a scale. So we're pushing for them to do something about it. But 
in the meantime, in the interim, it's important to recognize that the local community has actually embraced other biodiversity. Uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, engaged activities, whether it's looking, releasing toadlets into, into the dune slacks, whether it's doing biodiversity tours with, lo with uh, visitors and local schools. And they have things like spotter sheets. They've really spent a lot of time learning about what, what do they have on their dunes. And they've built these beautiful spotter sheets and they do tours in the summertime when visitors are around to look at these incredible, unique species like the bee orchid, the, the pyramid orchid or the burnet rose. And so the place has been reinvented. You can see they also do uh, uh, the fauna. They do, you can go and spot for the, the famous six spot burnet moth is um, prevalent along the dunes there as is the butterfly and so lots of heritage is a problem and so they've how do you actually fix that that's an interesting one and so one of the things i like to point out here is they took back the place names as such uh they did a, the local group got together they got funding to actually put up simple it's a simple fix but it's so effective where Maybe some of the younger community didn't know what where were where were certain locations, and so now there's all these signposts and lovely slate to show where the areas are. They also got funding to do a book by a local historian who happened to be there, who's a, a, a very important resource locally, where they did the place names and Maharis. And you go to that book, you can look at a, a map, look at the local name like Milok, uh, a land differing quality to land around it here which I've emphasized, and that's because that's where the flooding is. But you can look, and this is the real Ireland where all the, there's so much, we're steeped in history and every name has, 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 has a source and a meaning. It's so important to actually document this. They've actually won big awards recently. This year, just this summer, they won a National Gold Award for the Best Living Heritage event. They do tours. You can do audio tours online. And so they've really embraced their heritage. Now, again, they've done this in and on themselves, learning for themselves, by themselves, funding it themselves, bringing strategies for themselves. Tourism is a tough one because this area gets very busy. Uh, uh, but again, Jean, so, yep. just let you know you're uh, 25 minutes. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, what they've done is, again, try to control the way tourists behave. Uh, where, what we find is people are mostly compliant and once they understand why we, we don't want them to camp somewhere, why we don't want them to park somewhere. And so I've seen a transition where at the start, the group was always saying, no, no, this, no, no. But the, the signage and the message became much more positive in terms of welcome. Oh, please respect this area. Uh, they got temporary car parks uh, along the, the peninsula too, which again, is to, took well, this should be a, an easy fix in terms of renting a field or borrowing a field for a period of uh, three months because of the planning processes and regulation process in Ireland is really, really difficult. Flooding, there's some, this is probably one of the harder ones for a low-lying tombolo in Ireland, highly susceptible to flooding and looking at the area Kilshanig, there's really no other way to say it than you can't prevent the flooding. Other, other, ultimately, what you have to figure out is how to live with the flood risk and erosion risk in these areas. Um, Shane Coro did a master's for me uh, down this area, and he interviewed some of the residents in, the, in these areas, and they really gave us good insight into terms of, like, they're frightened of some of these storms that hit. They've also responded in many different ways. Some of these are, like, more household responses, individual responses, like things like flood walls. But also they were able to point out things like how to why drains should be cleared or why they're getting blocked and finding solutions that way. So a lot has been done by this community. I've documented 617 uh, actions for the period of six years there. And what's interesting is what started off as a lot of nature-based solutions and protection, they've really branched out into biodiversity, but a lot of their actions are in par building partnerships, building successful uh, relationships with key stakeholders and media and beach cleans and so this is a community that had to learn from the ground up in all these areas just to wrap up the Mahri story I really do believe this that and talking to the leaders I have a quote here from one of them which is after all this effort they've won so many national awards and they've been recognized so many times but ultimately 
despite this, they feel like they failed to deliver their their objectives and safeguard themselves in the long term, because essentially, and there's always these blocking points that every time every time they take an action or they have a plan, they have to jump through hoops. And so the the take home message here is that people can learn from them. And so that the term I use is indentured, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. But ultimately, uh. It's not sustainable. All the work that I'm required to do all this is not sustainable because what happens if some of the key leaders back away? Because these people have families, they have jobs, they're doing so much volunteer job, uh, volunteer hours. It's not sustainable or fair. With I won't focus on this now, but you can apply that climate resilient pathway model to what we just saw in terms of uh, clearing the road here, or the do eco, or finding a solution for the road being blocked in terms of uh, the fencing. Uh, if you don't take action, well, what 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 the end game is? Things are not sustainable and lower resilience. But ultimately, uh, I think what I want to focus here on is that we need do need an SAC do management plan that comes with actions that comes with resources for these communities. Uh, I I'd like to point you towards this report. I'm not going to get into this right now, but this this is the report that I I produced based on the Mahri's experience. We identified institutions and technical barriers and enablers for Ireland. Uh, just to wrap up, we're doing one or two other things. We're still doing, uh, trying to improve our understanding of what these coastal systems are doing and how they're responding in the short term and medium term. That's working with lots of different uh, uh, colleagues in civil engineering, in geography, and using different techniques such as satellite uh, mapping our drones. And so ultimately we're trying to really get a good, better understanding of what will these ecosystems do if we do tweak up sea level and storminess. And finally, the news isn't all bad. Uh, there's two, and I'll finish off on two slides here. The I was recently approached by the Climate Change Advisory Council to to, to engage with the coastal community because at this point in time, I have a good network of communities around Ireland, and there is no coastal policy in Ireland. There's no coastal plan in Ireland, so they want to build one, and it's really exciting that one of the first steps they've decided on is actually come come to the communities and actually have the communities inform them of what recommendations they should have in policy. And so my job working with colleagues is to uh, engage with communities and take their message back to the Climate Change Advisory Council to actually start building co uh, coastal policy that will work for coastal communities. The other job, uh, the other task I'm doing is looking at nature-based solutions because these are becoming more prevalent and you saw lots of them in the Maharese, but they're happening all over Ireland. But they're all all these groups have the same challenges, in same barriers, and we need to be able to remove them. So I'm putting together the list and identifying the commonalities and differences between them in different sorts of habitats. There's 60 projects already identified. And I think I'll finish off on this slide. Uh, I won't talk about it, but I'm going to leave it here, which is the recommendations from the that came out of the Building Coastal Resilience in Europe position paper and their scientific recommendations and policy recommendations, all of which I can absolutely uh, apply for Ireland and sh I've already shared with the key stakeholders in Ireland. So thank you very much. And there's two two pictures here. First one is the the impact the group is having in the media where they get two page spreads in national newspapers, hitting home the message that these volunteer groups need support. The second one is my favorite mural in the world, which is uh, a project the, the group did locally where the Natter Jack Toad is now uh, features prominently at the local playground in Castle Gregory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Eugene, so uh, it's great. It was a great talk. So I don't know if you want to keep the slides up or or take it down. It's uh, depending. Um, all right. So thank you everybody for for listening, and thank you very much, Eugene, for the talk. Um, I am not seeing any questions uh, from from the participants, but um, uh, there is a question from one of my colleagues. Um, 
uh, because they can't do it in the Q and A. So I'm going to read it out. So uh, she says it, it. It sounds like it was a case of luck to connect uh, because uh, so that the connections were made between you and the local community to enable them to be able to do something um, and and to have some guidance on how to do it. Um, but are there any more official ways for communities? to reach out and get assistance. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, it's a very good observation. So I showed you the letters that the community had written previously, 20 plus years ago. And unfortunately it's true that when the local council reads something from a Dr. Eugene Farrell, it read, seems to have more impact. Uh, so that's the first problem. And the second problem is this community is definitely unique, but there's other communities that I've worked with and I'm now starting to work with are, are actually, actually at the beginning stage. Uh, the whole point of sharing the Mahari story is that other communities don't have to go through the same barriers and roadblocks that they face in everything they did. And so it's that steep learning curve that they can really speed up that experience. And by the way, I mean, I've learned so much from this community. It's they, what they've done is out of this world and how they reinvented their whole area and the way they look at the area, the way they manage it. Uh, it's taking the learnings from them. My job is essentially is to share that with the, the, the governing bodies, the regulating authorities and other communities. And so, I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of this. The Maharis are very transparent in what they do. They're very open. And so, yeah, other communities are going to are have had the same problems. Some of them have actually mobilized and stopped because of the problems. Now the question is, how if we have a new coastal policy being developed the coming years, how do we remove those? Yeah, and and I guess that my my question follows on a little bit from that. Do you um, I don't know how close these communities are to each other because I've not really been to the west coast of Ireland, so I don't really have a feeling for it, but. Do they learn from each other? I mean, how closely do they communicate with each other to say, you know, we have this problem, you have the same problem. Uh, is, is there any of that kind yeah. of community So my number one, would you be my number one recommendation uh, in the report I'm doing to the, to the government is we have to copy what the wetland people have done, what the catchment people have done, where they've created forums and not only have they created forums, they get public money into these forums to do little projects. But mm -hmm. it, it, And they have representatives from all these managing agencies and governing bodies. So now you have a, a center of expertise or an area where you can actually find out what solutions to problems. So technically, no, Sheila, there's no forum, for Costa, but they do. It's a small country. So people do make, I mean, I know at this point they all have each other's numbers. And if people have a problem, they, they can contact scientists like me and lots of times I just say I direct them right to the community saying to talk to them and every, everyone seems to, I guess the phrase I have is uh, based on a, a famous book like every family is different but every family has the same problems mm -hmm. this is absolutely true of the coast every coastline every community is different and they're all unique and all odd odd in their own uh, special ways but they all have essentially if you make a list it's all the same problems yeah so I mean for me it seems like what would be quite helpful is to is to have a I don't know a picture book or a sort of a small description of what you've just explained to us all these problems and how they've solved them, you know, printed and handed out to all the communities to say if you have this problem, these guys have had the solution. To me, this sounds like a, 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 a maybe an easier way to get things fixed. Maybe not the right way, but an easier way. I mean, the right way is for the government to come in. And, and that was the other question that came from one of my colleagues that, you know, what can national governments do? There's loads of things they can do. But, you know, in order to get the national governments to care, that takes a while. So what can we do to help ourselves now? You know, having some easy easy to explain, these are the, the problems that people have had in, in this kind of situation and how they fix them for other people to know is a first solution and then you can also give that to the government and say okay how can we make this a more a more kind of nationally um coordinated thing 
a forum like you talk yeah, about. I mean, I, you're, I agree with you. It's just more trying, we've done it, we're, yeah, we're just it's trying to get the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. Time and money. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know, to me, it sounds like you get a good journalist and ask them to write you a, a, a nice story about it, you know, with some pictures and <laughs> it, should, it should not, I, I, of course it's difficult and it's not your, it's not your job. Right. But I wonder if that's not something that if I was going to look for some money to do something that actually can make a difference in somebody's lives, something like that would be quite helpful. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's why the penny has dropped finally with yeah. the government departments here. This is why they're, they're asking, I mean, what I presented there, essentially is what communities are going to be presenting to our team uh, in both a survey uh, next month, which is the, the project launch is actually launched last week, but for a survey and then a workshop. I mean, mm -hmm. I've no doubt because I've, de I've dealt with these communities. It's going to be, this, I, I'm just going to be packaging all their messages together. And that's going to be, yeah. I guess what you're talking about there, that's the report, I guess, that has to be delivered by May. And yeah. so I guess next May, I'll have that report. Yeah. And and then uh, another question that I that comes up in my mind has a little bit to do with the tourism. And and some of the some of the solutions you mentioned to me sounded like just knowledge transfer that needs to happen. You know, you need to have the so so tourists doing stupid things on the beach or on the on the dunes and just having good signs and, and those kind of things is a form of just making sure that that people realize this is not how you act <laughs> in this situation. So is there something like that also in the planning that you can actually? Yeah, approach? I mean, there was a national campaign a couple of years ago came out of the climate the Climate Action Regional Office. So they they oversee the local authorities and they mm -hmm. work with a colleague of mine here. And it was such a beautiful, it's a national campaign. It's like, dunes protect us, let's protect them. Mm -hmm. And they put these signs, lovely, nicely designed signs mm -hmm. all over the coastline. And as I say, people are compliant once they're told what, yeah. the, what why, why we want why them to act a certain yeah. way. And now, common yeah. sense has to, I mean, you would hope people have common sense and, yeah. and respect. But unfortunately, what we find is uh, people behave differently when they go on holidays. I, yeah. I've, I've seen that time and time again yeah. so but again oh i mean you have a situation here which is frightening which is you have the local group the Maharese conservation association policing the sand dunes in the summer evenings they take turns a team of two will go and they'll ask people to remove their camper or to hint mm -hmm. because they have permission from the landowners to do that so i mean they're putting themselves in jeopardy essentially because there's drinking going on there's anti-social yeah. behavior starting but the community group has decided to do this. And now, because of their work, the Gardaí Shikani, our local police force, have recognised it. Mm -hmm. And now what they've done this summer, for the first time, they gave us, uh, gave them, uh, uh, for the period of the summer, uh, a police presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, that's the community pushing this. And it's... Yeah. You, but I, yeah, I sometimes think that's how it always works. You know, the, the government won't do anything until you until you yeah. kind of force them to, right? <laughs> and that's where now, so now you've opened up a whole can of worms because this in Ireland especially, I'm, I'm not, because I, do, I don't know other countries, but everything is political here. Every decision, yeah, it's so political. And I love the fact that we have local government because the best, for me, the, the best people to actually manage your coastline is the local authority. Yeah. But yeah. man, it's uh, time and time again, I see the, the, the political pressures on decisions it's which is the, the best decisions aren't the right decisions many times <laughs> yeah and that's worse again because as we go forward and we talk about long-term policy that's going to emerge yeah they're going to be highly politicized politicized and highly contentious and i can't imagine that has to come from the top down because the local governments they they don't want to be the the, the front at the front of these decisions yeah 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 um, and then there's, I still have no questions from the attendees, but I still have another question from one of my colleagues. Um, and that's about the students. You talked about some of your students, master students um, that have been able to work with these communities. So how do how do they find the experience and do they feel that um, their degree uh, and training uh, and, and, and training, you know, enables them to be able to be comfortable with this work? So is this sort of on the job training? 
I guess, I don't know if your master's students are more social science or natural science, but certainly I can imagine from a natural science perspective, this would be a very different. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like a curveball. I mean, I've done in most years, we've a, we have a master's program in coastal marine environments, a 12 month taught master's mm -hmm. and the highlight every year is I bring them down to this area for four days, five days, and we do the full suite of activities. And at that point in time, sometimes a couple of master dissertations emerge, but yeah, I mean, when I, it, it, students are blown away when they actually, I because I can lecture on this all day, every day, but actually it's only when you're on the ground. Yeah. And that's why we're really, I'm really cognizant that when I, if I get an invitation to do something, I automatically, I, I go straight, you know, talk to the group, let yeah. them present their problems. And then I've really encouraged some of the key decision makers to actually come visit and they have, Mm -hmm. The Climate Change Advisory Council, who are who informed the ministers of climate adaptation and climate mitigation plans, they came twice now to Maharis and they're really, they've really just emphasised that we want to know what's gone on here. Mm -hmm. Tell us, put in a report by May, and mm -hmm. let's take it from there. Because, again, they can read reports all day, but when they get down there and they meet the local people, it's it, it's like I called it debate. That's the hook, hook them in because. It's very hard for them to ignore the passion and the the work, but also not ignore how much of their how much of their hours and days and weeks of their lives are actually done protecting the coastline, which should be the responsibility. I mean, yeah. the bottom line is why are we expecting a local group of diverse characters of all ages to manage a location, a coastal location? But that's a special area of conservation. It's madness. Yeah. So yeah. that's my job is actually point out the offenders and yeah. also promote solutions, which that's what makes this group different. They're very focused on solutions, not just complaining and pointing out problems. They're actually solution focused. Yeah. yeah. And I, I actually think that's probably the only way you get anything done. And just complaining, really, <laughs> if you if you sort of start doing something and showing people how it should be done, then it really helps as well. I think the phrase is, Sheila, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And <laughs> that's them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So I don't know if there's any other questions or if anybody else has um, any more questions. I'm not seeing. Do, are there more from, from my colleagues? I can't see them. Um, and maybe one last question from me. Um, and it's it's kind of it's so we talked about the regional or the the provincial management or the regional management and the national management um but from a european perspective i mean with the water framework directive and the and the you know msfd how do you see that working with the um yeah with 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 the coastal zone very very difficult <laughs> uh, it's such an awkward position the coastline between the land and the sea and this ribbon that no one seems to want that's <laughs> that's the take-home message i've certainly learned since i came back to ireland uh uh we don't know i mean that's the bottom line the we the i mean ultimately the high water mark is still the defining line in ireland mm -hmm. and that the high water mark on the upper part of the beach has two rulers to the landward and seaward uh, never the twain will meet sort of thing but they're trying to there's movement here to extend that to it there's a near shore zone after being created and so it's just going to take time and we're going to have to learn on the job i mean we talk about a, adapt, uh, adaptive management but mm. all this means if you think about marine spatial planning is six-year cycles mm -hmm. so no matter what happens we have to be able to adapt and the structures that we have have to be able to respond and not be mm -hmm. not just become static box tick box tickers i mean it just i mean the answer is actually it's unknown as yet but what we do know is we can come up with solutions at least of uh of removing the bars i, I pointed out in the in the presentation mm -hmm. but europe i mean ultimately ireland because we know iczm as such directive there's no legis legislative onus on us to do anything mm -hmm. it has to come from things like uh the green deal i mean there's mm -hmm. Only coming uh, nature-based solutions and bringing mm -hmm. looking at nature and 
the more we understand the value of nature and actually the economic contribution it brings to these mm -hmm. areas, I think then the the investments will start to follow. But it's a, it's going to be this is the kind of the path I'm on right now, which is actually linking what's there to sort of financial investments uh, mm -hmm. on the big picture of on the big scale of European funding that's coming down quickly. Yeah. And also maybe, um, you know, you talk there about nature contributions and, and, and sort of those kind of things. I think it's probably, in a sense, that specific community is quite similar to the SID, the smaller, uh, small island develop developing states. I mean, yeah. they're not developing, but they have the same the same issue um, with, with you know, their their land is is going, is, is blowing away because of because of climate change. And yeah, so that's that's something to think about, maybe that there's actually some linkages between these these communities on the edge <laughs> on the edge of, of countries and and other communities in in you know small island developing states that you might want to consider um, yeah absolutely I, I do believe we can become an example for all i mean I, this is only discussion i had yesterday sheila where if we do things right here we can be leaders and set an example for Mm -hmm. All those developing states, which uh, share very similar characteristics, warmer weather, but similar other characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. So maybe what I'll do is I will share my street screen again. And uh, just uh, well, if people still want to think of more questions, just in the meantime, uh, remind you that, um, well, say thank you very much to Eugene again for for the presentation. It was great. It was really nice to to hear about this, um, and to remind you that our next uh, third Thursday science webinar will be on the seventh of December, a little bit earlier in December, um, at one o'clock, and it will be by Tosta Tanua on sailing for oxygen. It's uh, how citizen science can help understand oxygen ocean deoxygenation. Um, and so, yeah, so that'll be at one o'clock, not CEST, C-E-T, there's no summer in that in December, except there will be where I am, but not not here. Um, so it will be one o'clock Central European time on Thursday, the 7th of December. So I don't know if there's any other last words from you, Eugene, except to say from me, from my side, thank you so very much. Um, for the work you did on the coastal resilience document. It's been a, a great success, I think. And I think we'll have a few more talks about some of the science behind it um, in the new year. But um, yeah, so it's good to hear about the, this case study and, and sort of the barriers um, and Thank how you. the community has, has achieved resilience or not there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.